ora. Welcome to Women Power. This week we're looking at why we demonise solo mothers and why we keep them and their children in poverty. We pay them extremely low benefits, seemingly as punishment for not being in the paid workforce. Why do the absent fathers get off scot-free? And why don't we realise that we're actually punishing the children and making it less likely they can grow up to be fully participating members of society. Tax evasion costs New Zealand between one and six billion dollars a year. There is 2.6 billion in unpaid child support owing and more than 591 million is owed to the government in fines and reparation. Yet it is benefit fraud costing about 23 million a year that gets all the sanctions and condemnation. To talk more about our punitive attitudes to mothers on benefits, I'm joined now by Green Party leader Materia Ture. Kia ora Materia, welcome to the programme. Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora to you and to all of the um, viewers out there as well. Why are women on the DPB so demonised in New Zealand? I think, I think they're an easy target. They have no economic power. They are um, under enormous strain, trying to take care of their kids and build their lives. Uh, they, uh, they don't have any political power and they're incredibly vulnerable politically. And we saw that when, when uh, two beneficiary solo parents came out opposing Paula Bennett's decision to remove the training incentive allowance. So they came out very bravely saying this is how it was going to affect their lives. It was a, they were real and genuine stories. Uh, and then she revealed their personal, personal details for the entire country. They had uh, situations where their kids were being harassed, you know, where, where that they were being harassed and so were their kids because they had come out saying, you know, this is actually going to have a real cost to us. So the, you know, sole parents, particularly those who are on the benefit, just have no power uh, and, and they get demonised by politicians because they're an easy target. And there's an awful lot of hypocrisy going on with that because tax evaders in New Zealand every year cost us up to six billion. Fathers owe about 2.6 billion in child support and benefit fraud costs us 23 million. Mm. So how come it's the solo mums that are getting all the yeah. condemnation? As you say, it's because they don't have any power. I think it's that. I think there's a, uh, there's a nasty moralistic streak in the Conservatives and it's played out particularly by National and even um, to some extent Labor did so in the 2000s too. They didn't roll it back that much. And so uh, there's a real judgmental approach to these women. Uh, there's a, a kind of solo parent that is talked about, usually young, usually Māori, usually has more than, than two children. Um, even John Key in 2002 was reported as talking about women uh, breeding for business. Mm. So there's that kind of nasty moralistic judgment about these women. Actually, the vast majority of sole parents on the benefit are women whose marriages have broken up. They're over 25. There's only 0.1% are 18 or 19. So the, the, uh, this, the image of the solo mother uh, is so, so different from mm. the reality of the majority of women who need support. But again, those women are just not in a position to fight back. And also, you never hear in the media how little women actually get on the benefit to support their families. There's never statistics used, and mm. that's why when I'm talking about it, I always use the figures, because people are actually shocked when they think about, well, how would I manage to support myself and children on that little each week? Well, that's right. It's around about half the median wage that a woman in work would normally get. So these women who are having to take care of their kids and maintain their home and rebuild their lives and relationships after a relationship breakdown, you know, also have no money with which to do this. Um, now with the new reforms that have come in, they have to, you know, they're required to have their um, little ones in early childhood education, they're required to go out looking for work. All of these things have costs associated, especially if they have to use transport public or their private transport to get you know, two job interviews or to get their kids to and from school and early childhood as well. So the, the costs of the welfare reforms for individual sole parents and their kids have really um, increased. There's been certainly no increase in the benefit. Mm. Uh, 
um, and they that and they continue to be demonised. I mean, the, the welfare fraud is really interesting in that respect because you know it is very difficult to live on so little money when you've got so many demands on you and and your your kids are in real need. Um, so, but what we find is that a, a person who has been convicted of welfare fraud has, I think, a, is a 60% chance of going to jail. A person who's been convicted of tax fraud has a around 20, 22% chance of going to jail. The, there is this huge discre discrepancy, like you, say, like you say, and it's based on these judgments about, um, particularly about women, some of whom end up going to prison because they've had to engage in some other kind of, um, you know, had to fiddle around with their benefits a bit in order to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. What happens with their kids then? Yeah, I mean, it's actually punishing the children, isn't it? But also, um, the legal test for relationship and the nature of marriage, mm. which is um, what qualifies you or not qualifies you for the DPB, is actually really complicated. And yes. I know in my work, I've often found that working income has wrongly applied yes. it. And I mean, there are definitely women in New Zealand who've gone to jail wrongly because the wrong test has been applied. Well, that's right. That's right. So uh, it is a complicated test. And the test itself, I think, I, I remembered from the from when it first came in, does set a fairly high bar for um, it to be, for a woman to be declared to be in a relationship, uh, and that was great. I remember that when that happened, then it came out. But if if the women's workers don't know how to apply that test appropriately, then we will have thousands of women who either are being um, charged with or convicted of welfare fraud wrongly, um, or harassed. And to, you know, I remember when I was on the DPB, a lot of the um, I had a really great caseworker after a while, I got a really good one, she was incredibly supportive. But before that, the level of harassment mm. that women get around what these circumstances are, having to argue for you know, the special needs grant to pay your power bill, what did you do with all your money and all of those things. It, it is not right for those people to have such a detailed knowledge about your life. People who are on the benefits are entitled to dignity like anybody else. Mm. Do you think that we need to have a New Zealand uh, living benefits campaign to match the living wage campaign that's going on at the moment? Because it's really just not actually sustainable to bring your children up on a benefit. I mean, I think people can sometimes just about manage as long as no disaster happens, but the minute someone gets mm. sick, the car breaks down, you know, the financial situation is just hopeless. You can't save on the benefit because no. if you save up in order to pay for school uniforms or to deal with your car registration or any of those things or, or a winter power bill, uh, Wynne says you have to spend that money on food before you get any further benefit. So you, you're completely trapped in the Wynne system. So yeah, a living benefit, a di you know, benefits that are, d a dignity benefit would be um, kind of campaign would be fantastic. But uh, and I think what we have to do is break down this discrepancy between welfare and other forms of um, income support for families. Absolutely. There's absolutely no justification for having welfare on one side and working for families on the other and superannuation and saying somehow all of those three things are different. They're not. They're transfers from the public purse in order to make sure that people have an adequate um, an adequate income, but there are different amounts for each of them. Uh, the in-work tax credit, which is actually designed like a child benefit, but is used to punish people for not being employment, that the discrimination there needs to be removed. Um, so we just need to equalise, provide equity between all these different groups that get some form of either government handout if you don't like it, or you know transfers for them to make sure that we have a decent society where particularly where women's work and the work of caring for our kids and caring for those who need us is treated as valuable work by New Zealand. It used to be that's why we have the DPB in the first place. We need to go back to that value. Do we value our mothers? Yes, we do. We need to make sure they've got what they need to do their job, which is taking care of and raising our kids. And also perhaps in the 75th anniversary year, go back to the original principles of the Social Security Act, which were to support people. But now, as you say, there's this distinction, work good, benefit bad, mm. and we're going to punish you and make it as uncomfortable as possible being on the benefit so you can go to a job. Mm. But the problem is that we don't have enough jobs. Yeah, that's right. So even, even the, the benefit numbers do tend to go, DPB numbers do tend to go down when uh, employment is good, but not that much for when babies are very, when the kids are very young, because actually they're kind of trapped taking care of their kids. Uh, so yeah, we need to get rid of the work first ideology that Labor put into the social security legislation. We need to remove that. Um, that's caused real harm. We can fix this 
so that everybody is treated equitably, where we value women's work, we value the role of parenting, and we treat everybody with dignity. That's, that's not too much to ask. And what would a living benefits campaign look like, do you think? I think part of it is arguing about, or arguing to reduce the discrepancy between the different kinds of transfers. Mm. Um, and that if we believe that children should be at the heart of our policy, there should be a universal child allowance. It should be decent enough for all families, regardless of whether you're on the benefit or working. Um, and, and to treat families and the work that they do in taking care of their kids as being the most important work that gets done. Um, if we don't do that, well then, you know, I think uh, we're, we're on a dead end road if we're not treating our kids like they genuinely are important in our economy as well as in our community. Because Marilyn Waring's book, Counting for Nothing, that was published in 1988, which is 25 yeah. years ago, but we still haven't improved that much. No. <laughs> well, the, the discrepancy between men and women's wages, for mm. example, still goes to show that women are still being discriminated against, and the solo mother is at the very bottom of, you know, the, of, of the pile. And she and her kids need us to defend and protect them as best we can. Thanks very much, Materia. Kilda. Now it's time for Woman Power Fails and Wins. Rabia Sadiq says that her war against sexist men in the British Army was worse than being held hostage and nearly executed in Iraq. Rabia was helicoptered into a Basra police compound where two kidnapped SAS soldiers were being held and she battled for hours to save their lives. When the Iraqis turned an AK-47 on her and another officer, she stayed calm, even when her colleague screamed and dived for cover. But later, it was Rabia's colleague who was awarded the Military Cross and promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Rabia's reward was a hug. She brought a race and sex discrimination case against the Ministry of Defence, which has just been settled. A new feminist group in Auckland has made its presence known online. Members of Feminist Daily have set up a Facebook page. Facebook.com Feminist Daily. Check it out to see which issues they're raising each day. The amount paid to people on benefits is very low, not enough for them to live on properly. The current net unemployment rate for someone under 25 is $171.84 a week. The over 25 rate is $206.21. The net weekly payment for sole parents is $295.37. This means it's a grinding struggle to get by, particularly so when beneficiaries have to struggle so hard to receive their legal entitlements. We need a campaign for a living benefit to go with the living wage campaign. To talk more about these issues, I'm joined by Sarah Thompson. Kia ora Sarah, welcome to the programme. Kia ora Katrina. What did you find in the beneficiary impacts that you did in Onehonga and New Lynn? Uh, both impact events, um, we worked with hundreds of people who were in dire need of assistance mm. um, but had been declined this assistance or because of how they were dealt with by work and income had really just given up on asking for their support. Um, and in, in both events, even seasoned advocates um, were just really horrified at the level of poverty that they were seeing um, and this was particularly so at our recent New Lynn uh, impact in September. Uh, and the kind of poverty that we were seeing, it wasn't just, you know, I had an unexpected bill and I need a food grant type poverty. This was actually ground in, you know, people living on, on their bare backsides trying to get by, people that had no power, so they had no hot water, no heating during winter, people without beds, so they were sleeping, some of them on kitchen floors. Um, you know, there was overcrowding and of course at the same time, um, you know, everybody in, in need of food with not enough money, um, to, you know, to provide food for their family. 
um, I guess also more generally in New Lynn um, with the latest welfare reforms. Um, you know, we saw um, just such huge need um, and it just really f reflected on um, a welfare system um, that is just, you know, completely incoherent um, and really with its main purpose of, of trying to get people off benefits and reduce um, the welfare spend, you know, whether that's through fair means or foul, um, to really just decrease that cost no matter what, you know, what the downstream effect is. Mm. What changes do you think need to be made to provide people with livable benefits? Um, well, firstly, um, the first thing is obviously to increase benefit payment rates. Um, at, you know, the social security system was put in place to provide support for people when they're in need, and currently those needs just are, are not being met. Um, second, we argue for what's called a universal basic income. Um, so this is a, a modest amount which is paid to all individuals uh, who are 18 and over and to those who are 16 and 17 and living independently and then there's kind of top ups for people who have children or you know who are living with disability or, or a 65 plus. Um, this universal basic income would um, remove the whole kind of name and shame um, aspect of the benefit system which um, specifically impacts on, on people who are receiving the domestic purposes benefit and have you know the government constantly in their bedroom trying to find out if they're in a relationship because it's um, paid on an individual basis it would remove that uh, and it can also reduce um, the you know the huge costs of welfare administration. Mm -hmm. How much do you think benefits need to be increased by to actually make them livable? Well, it's, it's hard to put a figure on it because it depends on, you know, how much, um, you know, how you know, what changes with wages, um, you know, increase in living costs. Um, but we'd like to see it um, set up in a similar fashion to superannuation. So this is, um, it's paid as a percentage of the average net wage, um, or in other words, enough so that people can get by without getting into further debt. Mm. Because at the moment we seem to be using the benefit and welfare welfare policy basically to punish people for not being in the paid workforce so part of that is keeping the benefit so low basically mm -hmm. as a punishment to you because you're a beneficiary mm -hmm. and that's bad. Exactly, I mean people move into work when their health and their family situations um, allow them to. Um, not being in paid work should not be seen as a crime and it shouldn't be punished um, you know, through sanctions, um, you know, through intimidation, through fear and through, like you say, benefit payment rates that, that just leave people in desperate poverty. And I assume that you'd like to see this current government's benefit changes reversed? Yeah, definitely. Um, the latest changes that we've seen, you know, they're the biggest slap in the face that we've seen since the 1991 cuts. Um, and we're, you know, we're urging Labor especially to repeal these should they come to power next year. I mean, so far Labor have said, you know, that they'll repeal, you know, the new employment policy law, they'll um, extend paid parental leave, um, but, you know, despite the fact that they were, you know, Jacinda Ardern especially was critical of these welfare reforms um, and that Labor voted against them, uh, they're yet to come out and actually say that they would repeal them. Yeah, it's not much good just being critical unless they're actually going to do something about it, is it? Exactly. Mm. And what difference would it make to people on benefits if they were paid the in-work tax credit or the equivalent? Uh, it would make a huge difference. I mean, through our advocacy program, we work with people daily, um, families and, and in particular sole parents, um, who have maybe as little as 20 or $30 a week to spend on food, sometimes even less than that. So if the in-work tax credit was uh, extended, this would give at least $60 a week, if not more, to those families to spend on food, mm -hmm. you know, which has all you know, the positive effects of you know, you know, healthy nutrition and things. So it would make a huge difference. And $60 a week is a massive amount of money when you're on such a low income, isn't it? It is, yeah. and the fact that it's not being paid at the moment is highly discriminatory uh, and doubly discriminatory for single parents when you know couples with only one person in work can still receive the in-work tax credit. Mm. Do you think we need a living benefits campaign to go alongside the living wages campaign that's being run at the moment? Definitely. I mean, at the moment, benefit payment rates are, are not enough to get by on. Um, and as I said before, or, you know, receiving a benefit shouldn't be a crime. You know, there are many reasons and many legitimate reasons why people cannot be in work, uh, and and when they aren't in work, they need to be able to get the support that they need in order to in order to be able to get by. Um, yeah. The main reason that people wouldn't be in work at the moment would be that there's just a huge shortage of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'd like to see jobs actually made New Zealand's number one priority and that the whole country agrees that getting jobs for everyone is our top goal and we're all going to work together to do mm. that. Do you agree with that? Is it something mm. you'd like to see? Yeah, definitely. I mean, decent job creation is one of our number one focuses. Um, I mean, these jobs would need to be, you know, well paid. Um, they'd need to have the offer of, you know, full time work. Um, the person would be able to need to join a union. Um, and at the same time, they'd need to be backed by access to education and training as well so that people can get into the kind of work that they'd like to do. Um, at the same time, I and mean, when we're talking about jobs, you know, it's really important as well that we respect the work that, that you know, the people are doing in unpaid work, such as, you know, caring, raising children um, and doing work within the community. Um, and we'd also like to see that respected and, and remunerated as such as well. Mm, because there's all these divisions into kind of people on benefits are not in paid work, so mm -hmm. they're not contributing and caring and all that work's mm -hmm. counted, or it's actually not counted because it's not paid. So. Mm -hmm that's kind of demonising certain sections of mm -hmm. society and creating divisions, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, if you're, you know, if you're doing that important work of, of raising a child, then you definitely deserve an income to be able to support yourself and, 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 your, and your family whilst doing that work. Thanks very much, Sarah. Hey, thank you. Now it's time for News of the Week. A new study titled boardrooms in babies and carried out by United Kingdom recruitment firm maternitycover.com found that 7 out of 10 women were worried about redundancy and felt that their jobs were more vulnerable if they took statutory maternity leave. A third of the women also said they believed they had been passed over for promotion because they were of childbearing age. Women professionals in China say they face more sex discrimination now than they did 20 years ago. Support groups inspired by Facebook executive Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, are starting up in Beijing and Shanghai to challenge the workplace sexism. Young women are commonly told at interviews that they won't be hired as employers expect them to get married and have children. The Ministry of Women will open six new women centres in Fiji before the end of the year. The centres aim to increase financial and income generating opportunities for Fijian women, particularly those in remote communities. Rotorua at the local body elections elected its first female mayor. It also elected the country's youngest councillor, who is Māori and female. 21-year-old Tanya Tapsell received strong support from voters. Women's Affairs Minister Jo Goodhue in a recent speech said that women in New Zealand had a long way to go. She said that she was interested in addressing the factors still hampering women's success and referred to the research report released last month called Realising the Opportunity addressing New Zealand's leadership pipeline by attracting and retaining talented women. A ferocious row about sexism in French politics was ignited after a Conservative male MP clucked like a hen while a Green female MP spoke in Parliament. Chicken is often used as a derogatory term for women and means prostitute. The male MP ignored calls to cease his clucking and the Speaker eventually suspended the parliamentary session and fined the man. France's culture minister said this was one of a number of recent incidents reflecting deep-rooted sexism in French politics. France has launched a five-point gender equality charter for its film industry. The plan was put together by a Paris-based lobby group. Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in a speech to the United Nations said that women's access to economic opportunity was critical and that discrimination against women must be placed on a post-2015 agenda. Statistics have long confirmed that adult women are paid less than men, but new figures show this discrimination starts in childhood, with girls receiving less pocket money than boys. Westpac's Money and Kids report said that boys were paid an average of $3 a week more than girls. Harvard Business School is seeking to create gender parity in the classroom and change a culture 
considered to be the breeding ground for corporate leaders globally. Harvard's first female president, Drew Gilpin Faust, appointed a new dean who is bound to do better on gender issues than his predecessors. Now it's time for the five action points from this week's episode. Implement a living benefit to provide adequate money for the families of those on benefits. Extend working for families to beneficiaries. Target tax evaders and make them pay the billions they owe to fund items one and two above. Provide support and positive reinforcement to mothers raising children alone on benefits instead of demonising them. Appoint an independent commissioner to deal with complaints against working income and ensure beneficiaries receive their legal entitlements. That's our programme for this week. Join us next week when we'll talk about domestic violence. We'll speak to the author of the book, Masculine Empire, which explains how men use violence to control women. We'll also be joined by long-time domestic violence campaigners Ruth Herbert and Jessica Trask to talk about how we can tackle domestic violence. Thanks for watching. Ka kite anō.